I am Laura Bornfriend here. It's important information, right? The Deputy Director of the Early Education Initiative here at New America. And just to echo uh, Lisa's comments at the beginning of the event, we're so pleased to be hosting uh, this, this event today to discuss these really important findings. And, and that's what this panel is going to help us do. So immediately to my right is Miriam Calderon. She is a senior partner at the C senior, uh, excuse me, School Readiness Consulting. To her right is Megan Gunner, the director of the Institute of Child Development and Regents Professor, at distinguished McKnight University. To her right is Peter Maggione, co-director of the Center for Child and Family Studies at West Ed. And immediately to his right is Angie Robertson. She's the project coordinator of the Education Quality Improvement and Professional Development for Early Care and Education. And you can learn much more about each of our panelists in your program for today. We have such short time to really get into the, to the meat of the discussion. So um, I'll, I'll direct you to read much more about their, their credentials um, and, and all about them there. And we are really thrilled to have such an expert and esteemed panel joining us today. So I'm going to jump in. And I just, I know what really sticks out, what stuck out for me is, are the findings on economic insecurity. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, after listening to the, pr the presentation and after, you know, reading through the report, what really sticks out for each of you? And we can just, you know, whoever wants to, to jump in first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, well, first, I just want to start by, um, you know, thanking um, New America um, and the authors for including me in this discussion. It's it's really awesome to be here, and I see so many faces in the room um, and folks that have dedicated their careers to working on this issue. So I kind of wish we could all sit in a circle on the rug um, <laughs> and you know really talk about this because I know there's so many important perspectives in the room. Um, and again, congratulations. This, I think first, the report for me brought out how important the transparency is around these findings and, and the real hope that this creates a lot more dialogue outside of this room about what we learned. Um, so two points and then um, a sort of that immediately jumped out at me is one is, you know, we know that a, signif a significant share of the early childhood workforce is, is comprised of women of color, um, immigrant women, and this is often something very important that we talk about in our field as an asset um, and the strength and, the, and this diversity as something that is, is certainly critical for, for ensuring that we have you know, a high quality workforce to, show, to, to be able to instruct a growing, diver, uh, an increasingly diverse child population. That said, I'm very saddened um, to learn that black and Latina child care workers are most likely to be enrolled in, in public benefit programs. Um, and I think that, you know, the recognition for me that Americans really work on the backs of women of color and immigrant women, um, and that for these women work doesn't pay off is something that, aside from you know the 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 efforts that we need to do to address all of these issues, I think I just want to raise sort of the equity lens for me as well um, around uh, what the implications of of continuing to allow strategies that disproportionately affect women of color that are working and trying to provide for their families is problematic. Um, the other sort of point that jumped out at me was the something that I think the, the study of 25 years ago sort of warned about, which was um, putting increasing expectations for the workforce on a shaky foundation. Um, and so when I think about where we are um, in this field and some of the things that I've observed, we're increasingly adopting, I think, structures um, that are most common in, K in the K-12 system about evaluating teachers, about defining, what unpacking what quality instruction looks like and what quality teaching strategies look like, developing workforce competencies, um, building um, professional development systems, um, and you know, and we're doing that similar to K-12 without the foundation that we know we have in K-12 um, around, uh, you know, entry minimal qualifications for entry level um, benefits and compensation. And so, um, I think again, the the expectation, I mean, the caution around these kind of expectations without a strong foundation. 
I'm also very honored to be invited to be here today. Um, I am uh, operating a bit out of my comfort zone, um, and I think I was supposed to. Uh, thank you, Deborah, <laughs> my dear friend. <laughs> Uh, because most of my work is at the intersection of developmental psychology and developmental neuroscience. I'm not the neuroscientist, but I work at that intersection. So you will hear most of my comments link back to what we are discovering about the importance of experience for brain development in the early years of life. So with that, a little bit as a context, the thing that struck me, and I think you've done beautifully in this report, and you did 25 years ago, though I didn't read it 25 years ago, <laughs> is to tie the, um, um, the quality of experiences that children have in daycare to the uh, how we are paying the people who are being serving as their teachers and to me in the context of what we have now learned about brain development how much the achievement gap in the size of children's brains emerges over that first three to five years of life how closely tied that is to the experiences children have by transitive inference, <laughs> we know that is related to the quality of experience they're having, which we now know is related to what we're paying. So remove that. We've got the quality of children's brain development is associated with what we pay to people who are working with those children. Most of our kids spend most of their waking hours in childcare. So childcare is the context of the developing brain. If we are unwilling to pay them more, lots more than what we pay for people who work in doggy daycare, then by extension, it means that we value the development of our puppies' brains as much or more so than we value the development of the brains of the children who will be the people to compete and keep our country sustainable. This is insane. So that's what struck me. <laughs> it means our country's going to the dogs, right? <laughs> Peter? I also am honored to be here and, and want to thank New America Foundation and the authors. And um, it, it's really such an important piece of work. Uh, so many things struck me. Uh, one is I firmly believe in a birth to five, even a birth to eight framework for mm -hmm. understanding early development. And I, my work has, con has been concentrated on infants and toddlers, birth to three, professional development. And when I, and you know that there's a difference between what pre-K teachers are being paid and kindergarten teachers and infant toddler child care workers, or I would say infant toddler teachers or care teachers. And uh, to see the difference in this report is startling. It's, it, it, and, and to know um, work like Megan's, which um, shows the effects of stress, and we know the, 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 the effect of stress on the people who are doing that work, and, and, and to know what they need to be able to provide. They need to be sensitive, responsive, focused, attentive, alert, really willing to give of themselves to the children, but to be preoccupied, to be distracted by the kinds of stresses in life that they're facing. It just isn't fair to our children, it isn't fair to the families, and most of all, it's not fair to those teachers. And so that's striking. I think the other thing that's striking is as a profession, and I've worked with um, various states and, and with the federal government around competencies, what, what should teachers know, early childhood teachers know and be able to do, we have a very tall order. And when we bring together the stakeholders from around this country, we recognize it's about health and safety, it's about managing groups, it's about being responsive to each child, being able to individualize for each child and document what's happening, understanding atypical development well enough so that you can partner with early interventionists and provide the kind of services that those children need, all dual language learners, all of that has to happen. And yet we're expecting people whom were not willing to even pay a living wage to be able to take on that education and do it well with passion and care. And I, I just don't think it's a realistic expectation. And we've been trying to live on this basis for too long, and we, we can't go like this. It doesn't work. When we do professional development and come back six months later to evaluate, evaluate it in a center, half the teachers are gone. 
So what's the effect of your professional development? Thank you. Thanks. Angie. I think what I would add to it is um, being a teacher. Uh, I remember going to college. I wasn't teaching 25 years ago, but I started school 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Um, but even then, deciding to be a teacher and uh, start out in elementary education and quickly moved to early childhood education um, because that's where my heart was. And I'm thankful that I have a mom that let me choose to be in education. Um, but that being said, it, what's striking to me about this report is um, myself as a toddler teacher, I chose to be a toddler teacher. I had the same education as someone who could teach in um, public school pre-K and Head Start, but made the choice to be an infant toddler teacher and made substantially less than um, my counterparts. And so I think what's striking to me about this report is that we, as a field, have increased our education, but the salaries have not increased. I think the other thing that is striking to me every day as I go into child care programs is we are teaching the future engineers, the future politicians, the future doctors and lawyers. Um, all those skills they need, the negotiating skills, uh, how to work together, uh, the order of thing, organizations, those kinds of things. We're teaching all those things, and that's very important and very critical for us to do for those children. Um, but we aren't receiving what we need for ourselves. So those are the things that, were, that stood out for me. Thank you. Megan, we, we know that, um, you know, the research tells us that, that stress and especially toxic stress is so damaging on, on children, but also the teachers. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. How long do I have? <laughs> uh, <laughs> quickly. Preschool teachers, people who work with young children, have to be fantastic at executive functions. Right? They are constantly, it's a very analytic situation. If you're going to do this really well, and I want to argue that we can no longer tolerate good enough brain development, if we are going to compete with all the countries around the world that are providing excellent early experiences for the kids, in this global marketplace, we have to have better than excellent brain development, which requires better than excellent teachers. So it requires this capacity to analyze what's happening in the moment, figure out what concept the child could be learning, which physics concept should I be teaching here, which numerical concept is this appropriate for, what language arts can I do in the moment, dynamically. That really takes analytic skills, executive functions, ordering and sequences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and knowing a lot of information. One, that's your prefrontal cortex on steroids, guys. Not on steroids, actually. That would hurt it. <laughs> <laughs> but you really have to have a highly developed and well-functioning set of executive function circuits in the prefrontal cortex. Stress targets the prefrontal cortex. As any of us know who have been under feeling anxious, worried, and stressed, we cannot, what? Think straight. That is our executive functions have been taken offline so we can act immediately and impulsively and probably inappropriately to those children in our care or whatever. So the reason stress is so bad in these contexts is it unhooks the very capacities that we need for teachers to have to be the most effective and develop the most powerful brains that our country is going to need. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so I want to go back. Um, we know that the original child care staffing study really first shined the light on poverty wages for early childhood teachers. We just, you know, we've heard about the minimal progress um, improving those wages. We've heard even more about the damaging effects of, of toxic stress. We know that young children really need the nurturing adult child attachments and interactions to really get the best start in life. So let's, let's talk about what's really at stake. Why can't we wait another 25 years for that next title that we want for that, ne for that next report? Why, why you know, what's, what's really at stake? Why do we need to get this done sooner? Well, I think what's at stake is the development and learning of the next generation of, of children. And um, also what's at stake is the quality of life of the people who are providing the education and care to those children. And I think we have a dual responsibility there. We can't leave out one without the other. I mean, we, we can't get one without the other. And I think this report makes that very clear. I think the report 25 years ago made it very clear. And we, we you know, 
I really have dedicated myself to the professional development side, but always I have this nagging feeling unless somehow we work out the, the pay side of this, the professional development, we can be very aspirational about it, but that's all we're going to be is aspirational. And, and so I think what we're, what we're talking about is are we equipping our children to do well in life, to be successful? And if we're talking about school readiness, we have to have people who can give full attention to supporting that process. Miriam? So we are a majority minority nation, so I would argue that all of our futures are at stake. I mean, we have a persistent achievement gap in this country, as we all know, and I would argue that the ed reform strategy has yet to figure out really what to do about it um, or yet to address. Um, and I think that we all in the room know that early childhood development is the ed reform, is the strategy around the achievement gap, even if, if, if um, some of our K-12 colleagues haven't really wrapped their heads around that yet. Um, and so, you know, I really believe that, um, th that that's why we can't wait. And I think the more that we see um, attention to this um, in the coming years, particularly as we, we have next generation assessments and we continue to raise the bar in terms of um, our expectations and our aspirations um, around achievement, um, you know, that, that gap is gonna continue to create a sense of urgency around this issue. Thanks. So, to continue to beat the dead horse, um, I think what is at risk here, or what's at stake here, is whether 25 years from now we will be the leading country in the world or will be a has-been country. We are seeing rising numbers of children, well, we have had uh, been on a slippery slope at all levels of thinking of education as a private good, not a public necessity, which translated means that brain development is a private good, not a public necessity, which means that over the course of the next 25 years, if we keep on this slope, we are going to have only a limited number of really powerful brains in this country to keep us at the forefront to be able to keep Pete in the kind of global markets that we're facing. Income inequality will get worse and worse and worse, and as we're hearing, this will threaten the stability of this nation. I think our nation is at stake with this. Thanks. Angie? I think what I would add is for, ter um, for children, what's at stake is the turnover issue. Having teachers leave their classroom to go work at another childcare program to make a nickel more or a dime more, that breaks a relationship. And for young children, they need those strong relationships so they, they can be comfortable to, to develop all those things that are really important for them to continue on in life. So I think the turnover is a huge, um, huge issue and that's what's at stake. The other thing I think is the debt um, that the childcare workforce um, takes on in having these low wages. Um, as childcare teachers, we pay for um, rent with credit cards and car payments with credit cards. And so the debt that we have is just unsurmountable. Yeah. Um, so I think those two things are, are really important and are really what's at stake for us. Yeah. So Peter, I know you mentioned that the first report, you know, really made, you know, had, had similar findings and made a strong case that change needed to, to happen then. And here we are 25 years later with, you know, looking, uh, you know, much the same. So why do you and, and other others on the panel feel free to jump in? Why don't you think we've seen any progress? Why don't we have, you know, a, a premium on, on education? I, I, I think it's a combination of factors. I think one is the younger the child, the more we have in mind that um, we can just let children play and they'll be fine. And the more we have in mind that it's just babysitting. And, and it's not real work. It's, and so you, you shouldn't have to pay a lot for it. Uh, but it isn't just babysitting. And, and I think that's the point that we have to help people understand um, in our society. You don't have a babysitter come for 40 or 50 hours a week during the prime time that your, child's brain, your baby's brain is developing to take care of that child. A babysitter is just an occasional person who fills in. You're going to do the main job of supporting that child's development. Also, we're talking about group care, children and groups. And children and groups creates a whole different dynamic for early development and care. 
we have to organize our environments. We have to create environments that will invite different children who are at different stages of development to, to engage in challenging learning. We, we have to be knowledgeable about development so we can adjust to each child on the fly. We, can, we need to be able to help those children learn to cooperate together and function as a group and manage the care of each individual within the context of the group. All of that, as already has been said, is, is really a fine-grained kind of work that takes this very sophisticated executive functioning. And, um, and what we haven't, I think, succeeded in doing as a field, we've been, we've been able to define what's needed professionally, but we haven't been able to help our society to see that. And I think that's the work we have to do because if you could see it, if, every, if everyone could see it, I think then we would start to get that change. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? I, I keep talking, so I <laughs> um, I, I think it's the, um, the siloed funding um, in our field. You know, when I think about, um, you know, looking at the report, uh, it's when I think about the different programs and, and the way the uh, salaries um, and the wages, the wage picture played out, you know, it was pre-K, likely, you know, more resourced than Head Start, you know, next, re you know, in terms of highly resourced or sort of interchangeable, and then childcare. So, you know, and I, I'll give sort of a, and I think the recommendations speak to this, right, in terms of um, required salary guidelines, and I want to underscore that. So I'll give a DC uh, District of Columbia anecdote from work I've done there. And um, in the, in, you know, in the in this wonderful city, all three and four year olds um, have robust access to, you know, uh, very well resourced pre K. Um, in the public school system, um, where I worked, uh, where Head Start and Pre-K in, in the vast majority of classrooms are, are one and the same, I always used to like to think about the fact that we had some of the highest paid Head Start teachers in the nation, right? And, and that structure was about, we brought in Head Start funding and we had Pre-K funding, but that was because we were operating in a system, which I think the policy section speaks about, with required salary structures tied to different levels of qualifications, compensation. Um, you know, um, uh, education qualifications and licensures. Um, literally, some of you know the highest Head Start paid teachers in the country, comparable to to all other grade levels. Um, more recently. Um, we have started to work on a strategy around um, infant and toddler care, right? Because what we all know ha happens when the vast majority of three and four-year-olds go into public pre-K in the private schools is we destabilize the business model and the cost model for community-based child care, right? And, and literally here in the district, we're seeing mostly infants and toddlers, um, you know, a, a, you know, in, in community-based child care and very few three and four-year-olds in community-based child care. Um, we started with a 15% reimbursement rate increase uh, for infant and toddler quality. No idea if it had any impact on wages. No ability to really track that, no way to kind of require that. So we put it out there, 15% reimbursement rate increase for infant and toddler child care providers and subsidy, and we don't know if it moved the needle. Then when the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership uh, opportunity um, came along, we said, okay, well, we've got some funding here, quality improvement, we're going to build in salary bonuses. Um, this is critical, particularly if we want to keep, to Angie's point, qu talented people working with our infants and toddlers in a city where you can go make a lot more money, uh, you know, um, working with three and four year olds, and you're still working in the field of early childhood. So we started to collect some data from our child care partners. Um, and, you know, in terms of wages, and we had, you know, benchmarked, I'm looking at Rachel, she's my partner in crime in this, and, you know, what, what can we do here, and wh how much money, and we really wanted as much money as possible to be able to go to the salary, you know, bonuses um, for our infant and toddler teachers. And we get, the data that we get back is, it's all over the place, right? Some programs, similarly resourced, are doing fairly well and right by their teachers, and some are not. So what do we do? Um, we're still struggling with that, but then it becomes very easy to default into this, well, let's think more big picture. Maybe we can put some more money into 
uh, workforce development strategies, we can put it into scholarships, we can, I mean, I think the point is it's just hard to figure out. Even when you have the opportunity and you have some resources, so I feel like this real lack of progress is really part and parcel to this lack of a bigger birth to five financing strategy. One that gets outside of all of the existing programs mm -hmm. and says, Who's going to pay for what? what are the, what's the federal government going to pay for? What are states going to pay for? What are parents going to pay for? It's the same, and that's where we build in these kinds of salary structures um, and compensation and requirements around the skills of our workforce. I was going to chime in now because I, I agree with both of what you all said. Um, I think that our workforce, the places in which we work is so varied. You have Head Start, you have for-profit child care, you have not-for-profit child care, you have um, family child care homes, you have all these ways in which care happens. And so when we section that off, when we do great stuff for early Head Start and Head Start, then that leaves out for-profit and not-for-profit. Um, and so I think we've got to figure out a way to make that go across the board. Um, the other thing I would say to Peter's point is, uh, years ago in the Worthy Wage campaign, we had, where we had folks would come do job shadowing. And what that meant is um, people who typically don't work with young children would come and spend two hours working with us, and then we would give them a paycheck for what they would earn in child care. <laughs> And there was nothing like seeing, you know, men with ties on trying to have group time or change diapers or things like that. And then we give them $11 for their work. <laughs> and then that made it really real for them to really understand what we're doing and how important and complex it is and, and the low wages that we receive. So I think until we make progress in making it more known how hard this work really is, and until we get to a point of not sectioning it off, I think we're not going to make much progress. Yeah, Megan. Yeah, um, Jack Schoenkopf and Deborah Phillips got me to work on Neurons to Neighborhoods a long time ago, and followed that up. Uh, Jack did with the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. What Jack realized was that we weren't getting there much, very far on converting what we know into what we do for children, and this is what we're talking, 25 years of converting it into what we pay folks, because we weren't taking on board the science of communication and realizing that we really needed to figure out the gap between what we know about what it takes to be a fabulous preschool teacher to what the public thinks mm -hmm. and find the metaphors, the language that will bridge that gap because we're going to have to change the public's mind. Mm -hmm. It is not about just loving babies. I think if you went on the street, what did it take to be, a, you, they need to love babies. Well, that doesn't take much education. That doesn't help. We need to get them understanding that it is really takes a mind that if they weren't doing childcare, could probably be a physicist <laughs> uh, because of the degree of analytics required to do it really well. I think we need to bring the communications experts way on board and work on helping them, the you know, the people to understand smart play or what it takes to do guided play because otherwise the context just looks like you're playing with babies and we're never going to get there. So. Right, and so still the word that pops into people's heads is babysitters when, as you all have just described, it's, it's so much more. So I'd like to turn to a, a more really positive question. What, what gives you all hope? Can you think of any, um, you know, promising programs or policies that you've seen that, that really are, are, are good examples, positive examples? Oh. <laughs> there are a lot of them. And the room goes silent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know of policies per se, but what I do know is um, a couple of weeks ago we had a meeting with childcare care folks because we were looking at compensation in our county. And so we wanted to really ask them what are the parts that are important in looking at that. And so one of the things they talked about was um, the education level, making sure that there is recognition for their education levels and that they are seeking education. Um, looking at the turnover rate, making sure that 
child care teachers are staying in the same classrooms and working with the same children because we know that's important um, for that consistency. And also um, to have somewhat of a salary schedule so that you know if I have a four-year degree, regardless of where I choose to go work, this is what I'm going to make. No different than what they have in the mm -hmm. public schools mm -hmm. um, where the parts and pieces that were really important to the teachers that we talked with. The other thing that was really important was that the teachers, the folks who are working with the young children, be involved in what gets decided. Mm -hmm. That was very clear. Um, to do that, though, of course, it means there's got to be some education on both ends, but it was very clear that folks want to be involved. Um, I think the other thing that gives me hope is I work at a university, and so every year um, we have graduates that choose to still work in early childhood. Mm -hmm. And so that gives me hope that there yeah. are folks that, that want to continue to do this. And um, for those folks, I tell them, just like my mentors told me, know that this is going to be your salary and know that it is not enough and know that you have to work hard um, to get more and make sure that folks know that that's important. So those are the pieces. That's what gives me hope. That's what makes me go to work every day. Thank you. Anybody else? What, what gives me hope, uh, well, a lot of things, but two, two in particular. <laughs> One is that I've had the, I've been honored to work with many, many early childhood teachers, both infant toddler teachers and preschool teachers throughout my career. And they are extraordinary people. They're, they passionately care about what they're doing. They're intellectually and emotionally engaged with what they're doing. They want the best for children. And um, they're willing to make sacrifices, great sacrifices, to pursue their passion. And if we can reward that, if we can recognize it for the value that it truly has for our society, I think we have the potential of unleashing uh, just uh, an amazing work in our field, but just taking it a, a whole level higher. The other thing I want to say that gives me hope is we have built great knowledge and we know, we know how to have a positive effect on the development, learning, and well-being of young children and to create a society in which we have more effective people um, mm -hmm. and, and, and are more competitive as well as more caring. We know what needs to happen. So if we can leverage that knowledge, I think, I think we have great potential. I would, I would say this, the shift towards more of a learning and development frame in terms of what we're doing. So I think echoing what Peter said, sort of our efforts to unpack what quality is, what effectiveness is, our efforts in QRIS to help parents sort of really understand that. Um, you know, I, I have hope that one day we're, you know, not, you know, we're not going to sort of be stuck in this place of, you know, well, we're going to help parents work and then what we have left over will support learning and development. You know, we don't finance K-12 that way, even though when public school is closed, I can't go to work or somebody in my family doesn't get to go to work that day, right? So, but we don't finance K-12 in that same way and say, this is about Miriam being able to go to work and what's left over is, around, is, is there to support learning and development. So I think that shift is positive. It gives me hope and it gives me hope that we really do understand more about what it should look like um, and our goals for children as well as our, our goals for effective teaching. Right. Megan? Yeah, I am hopeful that the more that the story about experience and brain development begins to penetrate, that we can help use that story and link it to the quality of experience, the training of the people in it, the fact that they are developing brains and not just helping people to go to work um, will finally get through. So I'm hopeful we can use it right. Great. Thank you. And now, before we turn to our next panel, we have a little bit of time for some audience questions. So if anyone has a question, we should have um, one or two people wandering with a microphone. Any questions from the audience? Oh. I think we're going to have a microphone. But oh, here it comes. Okay. Um, Hi, Helene Stebbins with the Alliance for Early Success. One of the things that struck me about the report was the statistic about the cost of care doubling in the last 25 years and the wages only going up 1% or 15%. And so I guess I would question whether or not there actually is a heightened awareness on the part of the consumer that this does cost more. 
but what the heck is happening <laughs> with the wages when we know that that's the, the largest cost in that? And I'm, I know uh, Marcy said they have no idea <laughs> right, what, what's going on there, but I'd be curious if anybody has any good guesses about what's happening with that funding yeah. if, in fact, the cost is going up. I do know that this is a question that's going to be explored in the second panel, but um, <laughs> if anyone wants to jump in with just a, a, a thought, I you know definitely feel free to, to do that. But also we can feel free to, to leave it to a panel too. Okay, yeah. all right, so to come. <laughs> and over on this side. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, good morning. My name is Kevin Brisker. I'm with the Council for Professional Recognition. And I just wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on something Megan said. You spoke, you alluded to um, a public awareness campaign. Um, we can ask ourselves, why is STEM so prevalent in, you know, across the educational spectrum now? Because they've been able to find a message and they've been able to pound that message across a variety of different uh, stakeholders. And I'm asking, where is the political will? Where is the personal will? Where is the public will? to kind of address this situation and how can we as well one as a communications professional in this in this field kind of advance that that cause any thoughts language and metaphors we need the right metaphor stem was a good metaphor is a good metaphor people who well, we can tie it actually to birth the three too um, because the public understands that boy we better be good at science technology and math if we're going to compete so what we need to help them understand is that babies start learning about these things at birth mm -hmm. and that we're setting them up with all I mean what is being done in birth to three birth to five is setting up all those constructs in their heads I think people would be stunned I mean they know they learned to count but that is like the minor part of what they're learning. So if we could, we need to connect the dots for the public um, and policymakers and do it better. And with the language and the metaphors that we can develop that'll get past that gap in understanding. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Well, did I wanted to just respond. Did you want to respond? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Oh, okay. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I think the public, the public awareness in terms of building political will, I think that's huge. I also think I'm part of building political will, going back to what I was saying, is I, don't, I think we need the policy, too, around how we're going to finance birth to five systems. And, and I don't think we're sort of, we're really there yet. We know what quality is. We're lear we know what quality costs, right? We know that we need very talented, well-compensated um, professionals. Uh, but I don't think we've really figured out that piece. And so, you know, that's the part that gives me pause around how we're really going to get there. Because we know we will need significant new resources um, to be able to make any of this a reality. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing a little bit better for a few more kids um, with a little bit more money that we're able to get if we keep working in the existing structures that we have. Um, I was just, I was going to comment there. Um, I've heard in a number of policy discussions, well, parents have young children for such a short time, and they're engaged when they have the young children, um, but then, then their children are older, and they're engaged around what to do with older children. And I remember, uh, bear with me for just a moment, um, on a plane one time, behind me was someone t um, who, who knew personally, the person who came up with the American Girl concept, mm -hmm. and what that person said was, the marketing idea was grandparents. Mm -hmm. That grandparents would have money, and if you could create this nostalgia with money, then you'd have all this investment in the grandchildren buying these, this expensive stuff, this really cute expensive stuff. I think we have to get the grandparents involved because they're interested in their individual grandchildren but what they don't quite make, the, they don't connect the dot that the future of their grandchildren depends on everyone else's grandchildren and how that whole society is going to work together. And if we could help them connect those dots and see that the life, that's the legacy they're going to leave for their children is dependent on this, I think that'll help. Because we need the people with the power, and it's the older people who have the power. And the corporations. <laughs> That's definitely how my daughter got her American Girl doll. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you? Did you have? A, okay. Um, I think. Yeah. 
No, we have time for one more question. <laughs> I, my question has to do with the fact that many of the young children, especially infants and toddlers, are not in center-based care. They're in family child care homes. And much of the statistics and the data that we were uh, able to look at in this report are based on center-based programs. Uh, do we have any information about the, the wage structure and the, and the wages of those family child care providers and how that relates to even those of center-based providers, which we know are very low. Yeah. Maybe do you, do one of you? Yeah, microphone over here. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. <laughs> a couple of the authors could r respond to that, and then the panel. This side. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we do. Um, I'm not sure Marcy Carroll and I have it in us to do the family, <laughs> the home-based version of this report. It would be similarly, you know, we draw on the new national survey and related to the profiles. That work needs to be done. I'm sure it will be done. Um, you can go into the Bureau of Labor Statistics data and look at child care workers who are in home settings. So, y again, you're going to be pulling from a lot of different sources, um, and, you can, and you can do it. Um, you know, again, you're going to have this absolutely, you know, patchwork quilt of people and places and funding streams and so on, you know, but it, it can be done. I, it might, it'll probably be an even more depressing, if it's possible, <laughs> uh, picture. Mark? Uh, I just wanted to say something about the issue of getting people to understand and the, what, Helene, your question about parents. I think parents experience early childhood as expensive and then they look and they think, oh, this person's taking in all this money, there's five kids here and they're all paying what I am, oh, they must be making a lot of money. And I think parents, you know, there's sort of two issues with parents. They don't understand sort of the, the economics and where the, how the budget works in early childhood. And I think the other thing, and I just was with some um, uh, friends of my son's actually who just have two kids and they sort of thought, well, okay, it's a few years, we'll do this and then we get to go to public education. And so they're sort of like, okay, it's, th I mean, the way the short term works is they think, well, maybe I can do it for a little while and then I'm gonna be, rel be relieved of that burden. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to really help parents to speak up around these issues too so that we're not making it a worker early childhood worker versus parent thing, but it's not working. You know, it's a lose-lose-lose right now for kids, for parents, and for the people doing the work. We have to sort of get people to think about, well, it could be a win-win-win if we had a different way of uh, structuring the finances. Win-win-win. Thank you. I would you. just add for oh. family child care, I think that um, <laughs> family child care providers, if they receive a wage at all, a lot of times family child care providers opt to not pay themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the numbers are even lower for family child care providers. The other thing that I would worry about for family child care providers is because they do have infants and toddlers uh, in their care, and that can be really loud and really busy and all the things that uh, Megan said. But the other thing I would add to is the mental, the, their mental health is what I also worry about, being the only person uh, in there all day long with the children, yeah. rarely having breaks, um, rarely having time to plan, um, talk with families, go back to school, all those kinds of things. So I think it's, it's even harder for family child care providers. Yep. Anyone else have anything to add? Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. And please join me in, in thanking our panelists.